Our bags are packed, and the three kids' tablets are charging in the back of the car, as Willow sits next to me, poring over the directions to her parents' place one more time. Lila and Sam are enraptured in some cartoon on their tablets in the back seat, safely buckled in to their child seats. Willow is my wife, the kids are mine. Oh, and Willow is also my oldest and dearest friend. We're headed to her parents' place this year to celebrate the holiday season and spend some lazy time away from the hustle and bustle of our lives. I must say, I'm the only one excited about the 10-hour drive. I turn the key and pull onto the highway, where thankfully there's a bit of light traffic, but Willow and I both know it's not going to stay that way for long. This highway is prone to regular gridlock traffic and is littered with construction on a year-around basis. It's a nightmare to drive with the weather, let alone without. We've been stuck in traffic that didn't move an inch for hours before, and we're both keen on avoiding that scenario, especially with two anxious kids in the back seat. Remember last year? That accident kept us stuck out here for three hours, Willow says, frowning. By the time we got back to, Mom had already made dinner and everything. Yeah, I don't want that again, I said. Willow smirks and flips through her phone. Just checking our traffic updates. It looks like there is a delay on our usual route. Should we try to take a different way today? I'm thinking. The standard way down is well known to us. We can list every rest area and fueling stop along the path, but the last thing I want is to be stuck in traffic for hours on end with my two kids, both of whom have such incredibly limited patience. Yeah, let's go around, I say. Maybe see some new area. Hopefully it'll be easier going. Willow reaches into the glove box and withdraws an ancient paper map, one that's been handed down through the family for decades. It's not overly useful, but it shows some other potential routes. She traces it with her finger, around a mountain range, and hopefully back to the main highway. What about this road? It would make our trip a little longer, but if the interstate is slow, it might actually save us time. I nodded. Sure, it'll be fun. A little adventure. I white-knuckle the steering wheel as the rental car winds its way through the narrow roads of the mountain range, and I feel a little tension begin to ebb away. At least we managed to dodge the traffic jams that always seem to snarl the interstate during the holidays. I catch a flash of movement in the rear view. There, in the back seat, I see Lila and Sam playing yet another round of I Spy. It's amazing how something so simple can hold their attention. Not sure what else to say, I look out over the empty road in either direction we had driven. Are you certain about this route, Willow? It seems very... remote. Isolated. Not very many other cars. And then it hits me that I haven't seen a single other vehicle since we turned off the bigger highway. She looks up from the map to me and then glances back at the road. Says here it's a shortcut. We'll be okay. But as she says it, I feel something wrong. The car starts to cough and splutter, the sound alien in the silence of the interior. My hands tighten on the wheel. Oh, come on, I mutter, almost in shock. I turn the key again, trying to start it, but nothing happens. The car is still unresponsive, making pathetic stuttered groaning and clicking sounds only. We're out in the middle of nowhere, and I can see the fuel gauge is still reading and the temperature gauge is still in the middle, but we're stuck. Zero bars on the radio for cell service, leaving us out here all by ourselves. Willow is already rifling through the glove compartment, digging around for the car manual or something else to help. Now what? She asks, her words laced with concern. I put the car in park and unbuckle my seatbelt. I will take a look under the hood. Maybe it is something simple we can fix. Lila and Sam have noticed it too, and both of them have turned to look at each other with matching expressions of worry. Are we stuck now? Lila asks, concerned. Why did the car stop, Dad? Pipes Sam. I push open the car door and stand up in front of the kids reassuringly. It's okay, guys. This happens sometimes. I'm sure it's just a little problem. I make my way to the front of the car and pop the release, propping open the hood. The engine is exposed, but I don't see anything out of place right off. 
I start looking over all the engine bits, searching for anything obvious, like a loose wire or a disconnected hose. Willow has joined me, having exited the car. The rear doors of the car open and then gently shut again as Lila and Sam get out and move to stand beside us, their expressions a mix of curiosity and worry. I can tell that the thing that they were playing with on that video game device now takes a definite back seat to the more urgent situation at hand. Something strange, while the others were all looking at the open hood, examining it and discussing what they were going to do next, I suddenly realized that I could hear something. It was low and muffled, but I could definitely hear someone shouting for help. I spin when I hear it and look at Sam with wide eyes. Wait, you heard that, right? I ask him quickly. Beside Sam, Lila cocks her head, listening closely. I thought I heard someone shouting for help, she says, worried. There is a moment of silence, and I can see the reluctance on the faces of the others. Things are already bad enough without making them worse, but we can't ignore this. We need to investigate, I tell them, looking from one to the next. What if someone needs help? What if they're lost out here too? Willow nods and meets my gaze. I can tell she understands how serious our situation is. Okay, she says, but we need to be careful. We don't know all the details, and we are not in the strongest position ourselves. I close the car's hood. Still not sure what's wrong with the engine, but we have more important things to worry about now. Let's stay together and lock the car, I say, taking the keys from my pocket and hitting the lock button. We all take a deep breath and prepare ourselves for what is to come. The cries for help have not lessened in their frequency or volume and almost seem to be waiting for our approach before continuing. Carefully, we begin shuffling our way in the direction of the sound. The four of us make a great amount of noise as we bull our way through the forest along the deer path, my boots and girl's shoes thumping on the rocky and leaf-layered ground as Willow follows directly in my footsteps and the other two girls keep just behind her, searching the dense underbrush with their young, sharp eyes. The thick trees block out much of the sky and present an intimidating wall of green. The dense forest is difficult to walk through with the thick roots crisscrossing the forest floor, but we're moving as quickly as we can. My companion looks worried but assured, even in our failure to catch a hand at the car. We're rather far from the car now, and I don't know how much more we can cover the distance to the car, but we're still going. My eyes dart back and forth from side to side, something like that. Sounds of sobbing and branches snapping fill the air around us as we hurry through the forest towards the sound of the cries. We're walking for a quarter of an hour when we come upon a small clearing that opens up to a steep hill that becomes the incline down into a valley ahead of us. I steal a look back at Willow, Lila, and Sam, and they're looking pretty winded, but are still all business. It's getting louder down in that valley, I tell them, nodding my head towards it, and we carefully pick our way down, using trees and their roots for handholds where we can. When we get to the foot of the valley, the cries are louder, more urgent, almost like they're somehow urging us forward. The trees are thicker here, the forest more claustrophobic, and it's getting dimmer, despite the fact that it's not even dusk yet. But I'm worried, and my heart is pumping so much adrenaline that I don't feel the dread I should at the realization that it's impossible for the shadows to be this deep, not with the sun so high overhead. It doesn't make any more sense than the ferns and snow with the unnatural cold and inexplicable wind, and I only know these things because of what I'd memorized from the cadet training manual. But it scares me more than anything I've ever known, and I want to stop and cry like a lost child. Instead, when I hear the next cry, I forge on even harder, my heart racing so fast I feel like I'm going to hyperventilate. After a few more moments, we pass through the edge of the forest and see a cave opening ahead of us. The campsite just outside of the cave is, thankfully, unmistakable, complete with tent, fire pit, and random detritus scattered about. There's nobody here, though, and Willow and I share a moment of confusion before both realizing that it's strangely quiet. I make my way cautiously to the campsite, looking for any signs of activity or recent occupation. 
The tent sits with its flap open, and I can see that it's empty. Tumbling over next to the fire pit is a backpack, with its contents strewn around it. It has the appearance of one that was hastily abandoned, dropped right where it lay when the person fled. Sam, who hadn't said a word since we left the car, spoke up. This is weird. Where the hell is everybody? I heard the tremor of fear in his voice, and it mirrored my own unease over the strange scene. Then Lila, from next to me, and still closely examining the dark cave entrance, the one that didn't emit a sound since we got there. You think those cries came from inside here? She motions to the cave, and we all look to it, the maw of the cave providing no clue as to its interior. The sounds of distress that led us here have fallen silent. I don't know. This place, something feels... wrong. I am not comfortable, I guess. Willow says quietly, looking this way and that around the empty campsite and the dark mouth of the cave like she expects a bear to charge out at any moment. The air is thick and feels heavy, almost oppressive, and I can feel a sense of urgency in her voice. We don't have a chance to investigate further before the creature comes loping out of the dark cave mouth. Its body is covered mostly in coin-sized scales, greenish-gray in color, and fitting together tightly to form what appears to be highly durable armor plating. In various spots between the scales, small patches of coarse brown fur grow, looking strangely out of place, but still somehow threatening. The first and most obvious thing that anyone would notice about the thing would be its eyes. They're a deep yellow and very penetrating, with vertical slit-shaped pupils that adjust their focus with an unnerving precision. Those eyes are set in a head that seems to combine reptilian and mammalian characteristics, most notably with a canine appearance to the snarling, lipless mouth, in which you can see numerous sharp, jagged teeth. And the limbs are thick and appear incredibly strong, with clawed, primate dexterous hands and feet on the ends. The tail is long and tapers to a point, covered in the same greenish-gray scales as the body and moving with a mind of its own, swaying and waving gently. And then it opens its mouth, and the human-sounding cries for help we've been tracking are exactly that, and I feel a chill run up my spine. Run! I find myself yelling it, and we all turn and sprint back the way we'd came, feet drumming on the forest floor, adrenaline momentarily blinding my senses. What the hell was that? Sam gasps for breath as we flee through the thick underbrush. I don't know, Lila cries. The sound of footsteps appears to surround us from the moment we depart the clearing and enter the forest, and I realize that something must be chasing us. I can hear its footfalls, and they seem to grow louder, somehow more immediate, and I can feel the chill it sends when each foot is placed, unnaturally loud in my heightened ears, drowning out the sounds of the forest we bargained for by exiting it. And then, as suddenly as they began, the sounds of those footfalls cease. The silence that follows is nearly as terrible as the sounds themselves. We still do not turn around, not even for an instant. We only wish to put more space between us and that thing. We stumble out of the tree line, suddenly finding ourselves back at the gravel road where we had left the car. Both of us are panting hard and our faces are red, but a sense of relief washes over us. We're back, and the car is still here, but it doesn't mean much. That thing is still out here somewhere, and the car might as well be a thousand miles away. We can't just sit here, Willow said. I could see the panic in her eyes. She fumbled with the keys, unlocking the door and turning to usher Lila and Sam back to the car. That, that thing, it'll come after us. We have to get out of here. Yeah, but the car won't start, I say, turning my eyes from the ignition and thumbing back toward the thick wooded area we just cleared. We're also outside of cell service, completely out in the open with no way to get help. We need to do something, she says, almost desperately. We're trapped out here. I don't know what that thing is or what it will do if it catches us. I look back at the car and the open hood where my family sits, reddened faces and tear-brimmed eyes, faces still filled with the relief and remaining fear from their recent ordeal. Okay, let's assess our options, 
I say, taking a deep breath and trying to keep the quiver out of my voice. We know it can imitate human voices. That's how it got us out here in the first place. We can't let ourselves be fooled by that again. It's even smarter than we realized. I fish the folded map out of the glove compartment and spread it across the hood of the car. We need to find some nearby feature or location we can get to and hide in. Some place that is easier to defend, or more in the open, where there is more chance of someone coming along. Willow nods, stepping beside me and looking at the map. Maybe a ranger station or another main road that is nearer than turning around and going back through the forest, she offers. Right, I concur, running my finger along the map. We need to get as far away from that thing as we can, but we also need to find a place where we can get the drop on it, or at least where we're not so out in the open. Here is a symbol for a small cabin, about a mile from where we are now, she explains, pointing to a small square on the map. If we stay together, we can make it there. Also, it is in the other direction of the thing we saw. So what? We're going to have to walk to the cabin and barricade ourselves in and wait until morning? I ask. That's our best bet, she says. I glance up at the darkening sky, and it's nearing time for nightfall, which will bring its own increased dangers. Okay, let's stay together and no matter how human they sound, let's ignore any voices, I say. I lock up the car again, doing my best to ensure it's as secure as possible, though I know it's far from foolproof. We each grab something that can be used as a weapon. I grab a tire iron from the trunk, Willow takes out a large flashlight, and the kids find some thick sticks from the ground. Not much, but better than being unarmed. We turn and head into the woods toward the cabin, such as it is, following the directions that Willow gave us. The feeling of unease here is almost palpable, and we jump with every twig that snaps, and our heart pounds at every bush that we disturb. I can't shake the feeling that it's still in here with us somewhere, watching us, waiting. The ground underfoot is uneven, covered with leaves and broken branches where I follow my guide through the woods. The sky above is dark, covered in shadow, and provides only the vaguest hint of unstable light. I grip the tire iron tightly in my frozen hand, finding some elusive comfort in its cold metal. Keep together, I tell my family quietly. We're all looking in all directions at the darkness around us, and our ears are straining to catch any sound that doesn't sound right in the natural cacophony of the forest. It's been too quiet in these woods ever since we left the car. I notice Sam stiffen out of the corner of my eye. There, he whispers, pointing to the darkened forest area with his finger. Turning my head, I see movement in the dark and catch sight of the creature. It is nearly indistinguishable from the shadows of the surrounding trees, and its eyes reflect our light menacingly. It does not approach, but watches us carefully. Why isn't it attacking us? Lila asks, her voice trembling as she raises the stick, white-knuckled. I'm not sure, says Willow, and I can hear the tension in her voice. Her gaze is fixed on the thing. Keep your guard up. It's playing with us. We share a look and we both start moving faster, as quickly as we can on the uneven ground. Still, even as we move further and further away from whatever's back there, the feeling of being watched remains. It feels like the forest is closing in around us, and I startle at every sound of movement in the underbrush, every snap of a twig by a footfall, as if they were gunshots in the stillness. At last, I spot the shape of the cabin through the trees. Ahead of us, the low-slung cabin presents itself, time-worn and wood-sided with patches of moss beds on the roof. The windows are filthy as we arrive, and I push the front door open to reveal the dim interior, the rusty hinges complaining from the movement. We don't falter, however. Entering the cabin, we lean an old wooden table against the door, stacking chairs on top of it for added support. Willow looks around, eyes moving over the shadowed space. We need to find some supplies. We need to see what we have that we can use. It's divided into a handful of small rooms, and I find my way to what must be the kitchen area. 
I open a couple of cabinets and find some tins of food and a few bottles of water. The labels are difficult to read, but I'm not ungrateful. Sam has made his way to a drawer and is opening it up. He raises an eyebrow at me and holds up a small red box. A first aid kit. Lila has found a closet filled with blankets and various cold weather clothes and is dragging a bunch of them out and spreading them on the floor, not unlike a bed, but anything is better than laying directly on the cold ground. Behind the books on a shelf, half hidden by dust and cobwebs, is an old radio. Perhaps we can use this to call for help, I say, lifting the radio from the shelf and setting it on the table. Cautiously, I turn the dials, trying to find the emergency channel. Hey, can any... can anyone hear this? I ask the radio, and it crackles with static interference, a little burst of white noise. The faintest hint of a voice comes through it for a moment, garbled and heavily distorted, but not even enough to be frustratingly close to understanding. Shit! I growl under my breath, my frown deepening as I squeeze the handset more tightly. That's when we hear it. The sound is that of the creature, but this time, it's not just any call for help. It sounds like my own voice. Hello! Is someone there? It calls back to us, a chillingly good mockery of the distress call I just made over the radio. Willow is looking at me, eyes filled with fear and disbelief. We have to get out of here, she says quietly, in little more than a hushed tone, as if she's afraid the thing will hear her somehow, even at a distance. I hesitated. There wasn't really any choice. It's night out there and we're in an unfamiliar forest, I said. We couldn't go trudging off into the dark again, with that thing out there somewhere. We've blocked the door and gathered some of the food. We'll have to wait until daylight. It seems like forever as the night passes, and every minute feels like an hour. Willow and I keep a watch posted, in a sort of rotation with the others sitting and laying in a circle, attempting to rest. I find it difficult to sleep, even in my time to rest, and lay tensely listening for any noise that might forewarn the approach of the creature. When Willow wakes me for her watch shift, she shakes me and asks, Did you hear that? I freeze in place, straining to hear, the slightest of movements around the cabin building. For a moment, we all sit, holding our collective breath, and when nothing else comes after a few moments, Willow starts to settle back. Lila and Sam, wrapped in the blankets we'd found, are awake beside one another, staring up at the ceiling with open eyes. They should be drifting off, but neither has managed to find sleep yet. I tell them it'll be fine, but it feels like bullshit when I say it. The unease of our predicament is palpable. By the time morning light begins to stain the sky from black to a dull gray, my spirits have risen, and I'm relieved to have made it through the night without whatever that thing outside was getting in and eating us. But now it's morning, and we're still here, still alive, still exhausted and scared, so there's that. We need to come up with a plan, Willow continues, spreading out the map once more. When it gets light enough, we need to make our way back to the car. We can't stay here. I nod. We have to be fast, just the essentials. The cabin door is ventured from behind, and the thing isn't upon us, so I lead the way out with one eye astern already, and all around the cabin there's nothing behind us, and nobody in sight. The morning light is coming down through the trees, and I find it's actually really pretty, all things considered. It's not too long before we're back to the car, making our way down the path. The trail is recognizable by the broken branches and trampled grass of its sides where we followed it last night. I keep looking all around us, watching for anything in motion. Stay close and keep your eyes open, I tell everyone, though I don't really think that needs to be said. We're all as jumpy as hell, half expecting something to begin rustling the underbrush or wail out of the forest at us. Willow grabs my arm, halting us halfway to the car. Look, she says in a hushed voice, pointing towards the clearing. I realize then that she spotted the tracks around the ones that we made last night, surrounding the center of the clearing. I hadn't seen them at first, since they seemed to be so close to our footprints in the snow, but my eyes widened at the implications of her observation. 
the thing had been stalking us this morning. We hadn't noticed it. It had been close enough to the two of us, a scant few feet away, and watching us, picking out where it would make its move. What the hell would have happened if it had? I quickly stepped away from the snow where our footprints appeared and put as much distance between them and the new set of tracks as I could. Willow did the same to my other side, some of the color draining from her face as she did so. We walked faster after that, the rest of the way to the vehicle, suddenly feeling like we wanted to be out of there. At long last, we arrive back at the car. It's still in the same condition as we left it, hood raised and doors locked. I get in and frantically put the key in the ignition, still hoping against reason that it will start and flash to life, that the engine will begin to rumble healthily beneath the hood and subside to its previous idle chugging. But after a few attempts, it becomes clear that it isn't going to happen. The car is dead. We're stuck here. Is there nothing you can do to fix it? Sam asks, desperation creeping into his voice. No, I reply wearily. I have done all I can. We do not have the tools or parts to repair it here. Willow opened the map again. What do we do now? If we stay here, we're just waiting to be taken, and we can't just wander around the forest aimlessly. I'm not sure. Let me see. There is a main road approximately two miles to the east. It will be a long hike, especially if you're not familiar with this land, but it is better than staying here. We start collecting the supplies we can carry, bottled water, canned food, and a first aid kit. We're still under observation. I feel it. Since we left the cabin, the thing has been nowhere to be seen, but all of us are a little antsy, a little hyper aware of the fact that it could be back at any time. You all ready? I ask, looking at them in turn. Ready, they say together. We look back once more to the car and the trees that hide the thing within the darkness, and we begin to walk back along the trail to the main road. We're not sure what we'll find, but we're needing to take a long walk to find it. Anything but standing here. The forest is still thick all around us as we walk, and I find myself trying to search every inch of the ground around us as we go, glancing up eagerly from shadow to shadow. And then I see them, in the distance, some small reflective movement as two small pinpricks of light seem to wink at me in the distance. And I know somehow that the eyes belong to the strange and as yet unseen creature, and that it is still following us, but still keeping its distance. Willow is at my side, and I can see the white-knuckled grip she has upon the stout branch that she has produced as a makeshift weapon. I know that she feels it too, the presence. She is edgy, and her eyes are flitting around, mirroring my own attention. It is a smart beast, not allowing us to see it, but somehow still letting us know it is there. The kids are all doing their best to be brave, but color has drained from their faces, and their eyes are wide with fear. They realize the thing is still following them, that it hasn't slowed in its pursuit of them. They are looking to Willow and I for some comfort, but what can we say? Periodically, I can hear movement in the trees around us, a trembling of leaves or shadow flickering in the underbrush. But the thing is simply making sure we are aware that it is still with us, nearly within reach, but not enough to engage. It's cruel, playing this macabre game of cat and mouse with its prey. Even the woods seem to know he's there now. The birds aren't making their usual noises, and the gentle breeze that passed by earlier has ceased to exist, like the world is holding its breath. It's uncomfortably quiet, aside from the sounds of our footfalls and the occasional rustling off in the distance, where I know the thing is watching us. We should keep moving, Willow says, voice firm and registering an urgency that she doesn't need to clarify. I think we all understand the why of it. When you're the hunted, you can't afford to stand rooted to the spot. I'm starting to get a bad feeling as we move, like the monster is leading us somewhere, like some sort of psycho, predatory game. And it's winning. It's stalking us without actually attacking us, and it's almost perfectly executed in such a way so that we can never forget that it's there, always just out our periphery. The fear we're feeling now isn't even from the physical threat, but the mental strain of being constantly hunted. 
Lila leads us for what must be a couple of hours before she says, Hey, check it out, a fire watchtower. We might be able to use that to call for help, Willow says. It's the most hopeful I've seen her look in a while. Come on. Nice job spotting that, Lila, I say, feeling some relief. Willow is already heading toward it with more spring in her step, and I follow. It's a tall tower, and it looks like a good place to get out of the rest of the crap that must be out here. We're getting very close to the tower, and I can feel rather anything. Anything is going to leap out and attack us now that we're almost there, and it's too late to get away. But nothing does. I don't see any movement in the trees or any gleam of eyes from the shadows, and the howling wind is the only sound, aside from the creaking of the wooden slats of the stairs on which I'm stalking. I tighten my fingers around the tire iron. The door to the tower is old and weathered, and I'm grateful to see that it is not locked. A quick, nervous glance back to the thick woods that we passed, and I use my weight to push it inward, nearly jumping out of my skin when it lets out an ear-piercing creak. I half expect that thing to come barreling out of those woods at any moment after that, but there's no way around it now, and we both shuffle into the dark room and help Ed close the door, shoving the locking bar in place to the best of our ability. The inside of the tower is minimally appointed. A number of windows dot the walls which look down over the forest below. A table and chair are nearby, and upon the table, placed before one of the windows, is a radio. Hey, Willow says, pointing to the radio on the table in front of the window. Maybe we can use that to get some help. I rush over to the radio and start fiddling with its dials. Let's check it out here. I say aloud as I turn the knobs and flick the power switch. A blast of loud, grating static emanates from the speaker grills, but there's an edge of hope to it. I dial in the emergency channel and grab the mic. Mayday, mayday, we need help. As soon as I release the button and wait for a response, I hear it. It echoes perfectly what I just said a moment ago. It sounds exactly like me when I said, this is an emergency, we need help. I shiver. It must be right below the tower. I'm just about to give up hope when a voice crackles through the fuzz. Forest Watch Central this is. Identify yourself. We're a family, a lost in mountains, I answer gratefully, at least another human voice. Something is stalking us and we need help. The voice from the station now sounds serious. Roger that. We can send out a rescue team, but they won't get to you until tomorrow morning. Do you think you can hold out until then? Before I can respond, we both hear the wooden steps outside the tower, and I know that it's the sound of the footsteps of the creature coming up the staircase of the tower. My heart sinks as I realize it's not staying outside. It's coming in. Before either of us can move, there is a tremendous crash at the door to the tower, and the big man is upon it, throwing his massive weight against it, trying to burst it open. Panic seizes me for a moment as I look around the room with wide eyes before I spot the flare gun lying in an open cabinet. We have to hold them off, I say, retrieving the flare gun from the cabinet and shutting off the radio. I place it back on the table and turn to my family. Hang on, everyone. I point the flare gun at the door. And then the thing is here, exploding through the open doorway and directly at us. I don't know if I'm imagining it, but for a moment... The thing locks eyes with me, and I could swear that there was something almost human-like in them, something calculating. I pull the trigger, and the bolt of radioactive flare flies from the barrel, arcing with a trail of smoke and light that casts a red-hot fiery illumination upon the room. The thing screams in an ear-piercing screech of shocked pain, but then somehow, it's back out the door and fleeing back down the stairwell. I find my way back to the radio, my hands shaking as I use it. We're on our way out, I tell the ranger as I push the transmit button again. We'll be here, he answers. We'll be there, the voice says. Then the line abruptly cuts off, and we're left in our high-altitude confinement in silence. The room grows heavy with the stifling silence, tension almost palpable, as if we sat in the midst of a heavy mist. We are safe for the moment, but darkness falls outside, and who knows what nighttime predators roam in the jungle. 
We're stuck here in this wooden tower with no way out until morning. That thing is still out there, moving around in the darkness, waiting for something, planning its next move. The thought creeps me out even more, and I get the feeling that the walls of the fire tower are slowly closing in around us. With no other choices, we both take some of the blankets we found in the storage of the tower and wrap them around us as close as we can, settling in for what will likely be a long and uncomfortable night. We spend the next several hours inside that small old fire tower, all of us crowded within the wooden walls and listening to the creaks and groans of the wind against them. A lantern sits burning in the corner, casting its light into the dark corners and creating elongated, wavering shadows upon the walls. We agree that we must maintain vigilant, and in order to keep our minds occupied and our unease at bay, we assign turns to each watch for the creature. Anyone want to volunteer to go first? I say, more softly than I meant to, more tiredly. I got it, Willow says quickly. She goes to the window, dragging a decrepit chair over and standing upon it, tire iron at the ready. Her eyes dart over the base of the trees and the open area beneath, searching for any motion. We try to make ourselves comfortable as best we can, and the two of us sit with the blankets around our shoulders and huddle our thoughts privately. Even though the room's chill is barely diminished outside of the weakened blankets, it makes us feel better like it's giving us some sort of protection, even if it is all just in our heads. Despite the threat from outside, Lila and Sam close their eyes and fall asleep. Sometime later, I feel a gentle touch on my arm and crack my eyes to find Willow next to me. My turn, she says quietly, and I nod, dropping the blanket and moving into where she had been sitting on our makeshift watch. Slumping into the chair at the window, I find myself staring out into the void of darkness outside. I can scarcely see anything. It's like black everywhere I look. I feel like I should be straining my eyes to see threats in the darkness, like some sort of movement in the darkness might come for us. But apart from the darkness outside this room and the others of the cabin and the numerous sounds of the night, I can hear the sound of a window sash from another room sliding down and the distant rattle of an old chain as it slaps against a wind-tossed flagpole. And something clicks and almost seems to move on the dark porch outside of the window. For a moment, I see a glint of light, a faint reflection of the moon in some unseeable thing right outside the window. I know implicitly that the shadowed shape is the tormentor, the malevolent presence that has been stalking us since we stupidly barged into the forest, Never seen, only felt like a weight on my back. Sam slowly sits up from his place on the floor and comes over to where I am. He takes a seat in the chair beside me and we both watch the terminal. He's rubbing his eyes with the backs of his hands and he asks, What do you think it's looking for? His tone is one of curiosity tinged with unease. I look back to him and then out into the darkness. I do not know, Cap, I say. It could be territorial, keeping the boundaries of its hunting grounds from interlopers. I turn back to him with a shrug. It could be curious, wondering what these strange animals are doing in its home. Maybe it is just malevolent, enjoying the fear it puts into our hearts. We stop talking, both of us lost in our own thoughts, neither of us willing to speculate on what this thing might have done. Sam and I just sit there next to each other, listening out into the dark night, watching the darkness beyond the window. I don't know how long we sat there in that raised state of anticipation, perfectly still and straining our ears to any clue of the thing outside. We begin to notice that we're hearing things with an almost heightened awareness. The gentle creak of the floorboards under our feet, the occasional hoot of an owl a mile away. At long last, after what must have been hours, the first light of dawn began to brighten the horizon. The sky went from pitch black to a lighter shade of gray, and somehow, the night was no longer the terrifying battle of attrition and endurance it had felt earlier. I could feel the slightest release of tension and despair within me, as if the rising of the sun brought more than just light. Hope, maybe. Hope that we might actually make it through. 
and then it gives way to a full beam of hope as we hear it. A sound of something slicing through the morning air, a mechanical thumping that begins to grow louder. The sound increases in volume, and then I recognize it. Helicopter blades spinning fast. Hey, the rescue helicopter, it is here, Lila calls out as she scrambles to the window of the tower and points at it. We all run over to the window and jockey for position in front of it, trying to see the helicopter in the sky. We immediately know it's not our imagination. We don't have to wait long for it to approach closer to building, and I can make out that it's a fairly large helicopter, clearly a rescue one, and with markings that I now can clearly recognize as Ranger Service helicopter markings. The helicopter is dropping towards a clearing in the distance, and I allow myself a relieved sigh. We must be just a hundred meters or so away from the fire tower. I can see the pilot through the cockpit pane and the rescue team readying to get out as soon as the craft lands. The tall grass in the clearing begins to flatten in a circular pattern as the blade sir draws near. At long last, I don't know how long, we both allow ourselves the briefest of smiles, the briefest of exhales, and the tension that has kept us on edge is released. I can still feel the menace of the thing out there, but without help, it seems the less immediate. I meet the other guards' gaze, recognizing the emotions in them reflecting my own. Relief. Incredulous relief. We pack up our small things and throw on our jackets, throwing small bags over our shoulders. I don't like the fact that we are going to have to leave the tower and re-enter the domain of that thing, but seeing the rescue team working below gives me a little more courage. We get into the helicopter and fasten our seat harnesses, each one of us another small victory against what we just went through. The padded seats seem almost overly comfortable suddenly, and I realize that I've missed the way they felt. The whop whoop of the rotor blades is incredibly loud inside the cabin. We all breathe a collective sigh as the helicopter leaves the ground and start to climb. We're in the air now, putting more and more distance between us and whatever that was that's been following us. I watch as the trees and rocky mountainside outside the chopper grow smaller and smaller as we ascend out the open door beside my seat, and am even more lost in my thoughts as my way more questions than answers. How many others has that thing encountered up here? How long has it been out here in the middle of nowhere? But the one question that keeps coming back to me is this. What sort of thing can inspire such overwhelming fear? We're higher now, and I'm watching the ground intently below us when I see a dark shape moving quickly through the trees. I don't know if that was it. I lost sight of it almost as quickly as I spotted it, and after a few moments of scanning the passes, my eyes could no longer pick out the shape among the trees. Slowly, it became lost in the green sea and then was gone.